I'd always been interested in nature from you know a young boy and and also in geography I used to spend hours looking at maps um, and when I came to think about university at the age of 17 18 and of course in the UK system you have to you have to actually determine before you go to university what you're going to study and for many years I've been interested in bird watching and I thought well it'd be great to do a, a degree in zoology and take up ornithology as a as a uh, as a career but I came to realize there were very few posts in ornithology and then in any case my interest in plants grew and so I, I, I applied to university to study botany and geography a combined degree so uh, I went to the University of Southampton in 1967, spent three years there. Uh, half the time on my geography course was learning about landforms, uh, glacial processes, river processes, uh, etc. But the other half was a full botany degree. And it wasn't really until I got into my final year and I'd, I'd become friendly with one of the staff and I'd taken a couple of courses. He was a, a, a geneticist who'd worked on peanuts and he'd worked in Africa and he'd then done his PhD at North Carolina State in Raleigh and anyway he stopped me in the corridor one day and he said Mike uh, you might be interested in this and it was a it was a pamphlet about a, a new one-year MSc course in plant genetic resources that was being offered at the University of Birmingham so I thought well this is interesting it was sort of fitting in with some of my interests at the time or the way my interests were going and so I made an application, as they say, the, you know, the rest is history. I, I went for an interview, they offered me a place on the course, and I started that in um, October, September, October 1970. It was a one-year course, and the intention was to finish the course and, and find a job. But the head of department at Birmingham, and it was a department of botany in those days, which then transformed, as many did, into plant sciences, the head of the Department of Botany at the University of Birmingham was a, was a guy called uh, Jack Hawkes, an internationally renowned uh, uh, plant scientist who'd spent most of his career working on potatoes and who was one of the founders of the plant genetic resources conservation movement in the 1960s. And one of the contributions he felt he could make to that whole movement was to train young people in the the discipline as it were of, of genetic resources because um, it had been determined that a, you know, a real concerted worldwide effort was required to 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 collect and conserve genetic resources anyway I went to Birmingham and got stuck into the course and at the end of the first semester he he actually went off to South America to Bolivia to on a potato collecting expedition that would be end of November early December and he came back in February the following year 1971 and almost immediately on on return he he, he phoned me up and he said Mike he said how would you like to go to South America for a year how would you like to go to Peru <coughs> well I had I mentioned a few minutes ago my interest in in geography and looking at maps and I was absolutely fascinated with the uh, with the the map of South America this huge continent of jungles and mountains and for some reason or other and I still don't really know why I had always wanted to visit Peru and here was the opportunity somebody uh, was offering me the chance to go and visit Peru and pay me to do so so I said right when's the, when, when do I get the ticket well it didn't quite work out like that because um, what had happened he'd gone to Peru he had uh, had collaboration from a USAID North Carolina State University Peru joint mission on potatoes. Uh, this had been set up in the mid 1960s and it was slowly transforming itself into what became the International Potato Center and the then Director General Dick Sawyer was busy looking for funding and he'd been to uh, the UK and he talked to the the people in the department that now is now called DFID uh, looking for support and he really wanted somebody to go to Peru for one year to take over the management of a germplasm collection while he sent a young Peruvian to Birmingham for training well what got in the way of me going immediately was the CGIAR 
because in uh, it would be or well, during 1971 the discussions were taking place to form what became the CGIAR and the UK agency was still debating whether it should join this entity or whether it should continue to give funding on a bilateral basis. So instead of going out to Peru in October 1971 as was originally planned, I got delayed for another 15 months. So I actually started a PhD at the University of Birmingham funded by uh, the UK government and eventually headed off to Peru in January 1973. Uh, so I had the best of both worlds in many ways. I was employed by the by the centre, by the International Potato Centre, but at the same time I was doing my PhD in a country that I'd always wanted to visit. And it was a marvellous time. As a, I was 24 years old, as they say, the world's your oyster and uh, uh, my fiancé, now my wife, came out and joined me in mid-1973, July 73. Uh, we got married in Lima in October 73 uh, and we stayed there for another couple of years or so. And I had responsibility for germplasm collecting and carrying out a piece of research on, on one section of the germplasm uh, germplasm collection that, it, that, that SIP was maintaining. Well, I went back to Birmingham in um, mid-1975, spent a, a month or so writing up my thesis, defending it, and making plans to go back to, to Peru. And uh, the decision was made fairly early on that they would send me to Central America to set up a program. Here I was, 26 years old, and they said, go to Costa Rica and set up a research program. Uh, and so we moved to Costa Rica, we moved to Turrialba. There was a, a, an international centre there, a regional centre, called Cantier, and we had a, they hosted me for nearly five years. And I spent time looking at adaptation of potatoes to uh, tropical conditions. Um, got involved in a lot of plant pathology work because there was a bacterial disease, bacterial wilt, that uh, became a very important problem of potato cultivation in that environment. So I spent three, four years working on bacterial wilt and also setting up a regional potato program uh, that was really one of the first consortia, if not the first, um, within the CG system uh, called Precodepa, funded by the Swiss and they funded it for about 28 years. Uh, originally involving six countries in the region, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, Panama and the Dominican Republic, but after I left it then expanded out into the Caribbean, included Cuba, Haiti, uh, Belize came in, so all languages of the, of the region. And at the end of 1980 I went back to Lima, I thought that I'd done what I could in, in, in Central America. It was a great time, beautiful part of the world to live. Um, our first child was born in Costa Rica. We moved back to, to Lima, not quite sure what was going to happen. Uh, originally, uh, Dick Sawyer, the Director General, said, well, we'll send you to, to, to Brazil as the re regional leader for the Southern Cone countries. Uh, but then the Brazilians said, no, they didn't, they didn't want a Yankee, <laughs> uh, even though I'm British. Um, so we weren't quite sure. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, a position had become vacant at the University of Birmingham and I decided to apply for that, a teaching position. Uh, went for interview, flew, flew from Peru for an interview, got the, the job and, and decided to return to the UK in uh, April 1981. But I had, it was, a, it was a, a, quite an exciting time because the Director General had already said to me, um, I think it's a great idea that you go for an interview, but if you're not successful, here's a contract waiting for you when you come back and we'll send you to the Philippines. Well, I didn't go to the Philippines in 1981. It took a further 10 years, um, but here I am. So, went back to Birmingham, I set up a, a had to essentially devise a, a, a teaching program, mainly graduate teaching on genetic resources. Um, set up a fairly active research program on potatoes, but also on legume species. Um, had a good crop of PhD students came through, uh, and that was that was an interesting time. Second child was born during the uh, during the 80s, and second daughter. 
I started to become restless towards the, the end of the 1980s, um, in, no, in due in no small part to Margaret Thatcher and her government. So and, and in, a, in a sense, I can, you can blame the fact that I came to, to Erie on, on Margaret Thatcher. Um, her government was imposing a lot of measures on the university system. Uh, and I was getting very uncomfortable with this and I, I started to question my role within the university system. I enjoyed the teaching, um, but advancement within the, um, within the university system didn't necessarily take into account one's complete contributions. I mean, your research was paramount and yet you're expected to do all this teaching, which I was doing. Um, and uh, so when the opportunity came, one day, out of the blue, uh, an, an advertisement landed on my desk. I don't know who it came from, friend or foe. And it was for the position of the head of what was then called the Rice Genetic Resources Center at, uh, at Erie. So I, I put an application. That would be around about September or so, 1990. And I was called for interview the first week of January, uh, 1991. And it's rather interesting, there were three candidates that were interviewed. Uh, we all knew each other, uh, obviously in the world of genetic resources, but even more so, we all had MSCs and PhDs from the University of Birmingham. And we'd all been supervised by the same major professor. Um, which caused a little bit of consternation when, uh, amongst the, the folks here at Erie, because, you know, we all came in at the same time, we, we socialised with each other, we talked about things, and they were a bit concerned that, you know, that we would feel uncomfortable about being at Erie for interview. And, but no, it all worked out fine. I, I waited a few weeks, they, they phoned me, offered me the job, I accepted, more or less, and came here in July 1991. Came on my own in the first instance, left the family back in the UK, got myself settled in, and then towards the end of December 1991, that's when the family turned up. I'd only, uh, when, when I joined here, I'd only actually visited Asia once. Uh, that was in the mid-1980s when I attended a, a meeting in, in Jakarta, and that's where I met T.T. T. Chang uh, for the first time. So I'd not travelled in Asia, and, and I, I have to admit, my, my focus, my interest, was clearly in Latin America. Um, I, I absolutely adored living in Latin America. I, uh, I'd, I'd always wanted to go there, I became fluent in Spanish. <clears throat> so it was, it was um, a very exciting time in my life, and I was obviously that much younger. Uh, so I joined Erie when I was in my early 40s, and this was, really represented quite a, quite a challenge. As I said, uh, uh, I had been given the chance 10 years earlier to come to the Philippines, but had moved back to the UK. So it was, it was with both excitement and some trepidation that we made the decision to move to Asia. And it was also uh, a concern because I had daughters at that time who were 13 and 9 years old and taking them out of the, uh, the education system in the UK and then faced with putting them into a, a really, I would say, alien education system in an international school. Um, as things turned out, that, that was not a problem and they both benefited enormously from the experience of living abroad, from attending international schools, and having a, 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 a big circle of friends from, from wherever. I think that's really one of the positives that we take away from all our years, is that multicultural experience for, for all of us in coming to Asia. And Asia was also a, a big eye-opener. I mean, it's so different from all of my experiences to date. And I'm sure for many people when they come to to Erie, it's a time of adjustment. Took me, I suppose, three or four years, maybe a little longer before I uh, started to calm down driving and other elements of living in the Philippines. But you know, I'm, I think age also helps. <laughs> well, it, uh, in those days, the, 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 the position had been advertised to bring together what had 
what at that time was called the International Rice Germplasm Centre, which was the gene bank, the International Network for Genetic Evaluation of Rice, INJA, and the Seed Health Unit all into one entity. And that's what I was interviewed for. <coughs> By the time between interview in January 91 and arriving in July 91, a decision had been made to take the seed health unit out of the equation, which I think was a very wise move because uh, with both the gene bank and injure, you're, you're managing seeds, you're distributing seeds, receiving seeds. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, the seed health unit is, is there to ensure that uh, you know things are done correctly and you don't really want to be in a situation of gamekeeper and poacher as it as it were in the management of seeds so that um, uh, was out of the equation it really was a challenge in two ways on both the gene bank side and the genetic resources center in general on the gene bank side when I came here for interview I mean, we were all shown around the institute we were shown the gene bank and there you have this well-oiled entity the gene bank that operated you know it was slick uh, everything happened etc et, 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 et when i got here and as it were pulled back that veneer and found out how things were actually operating i was really quite shocked um, there was very little application of best practice. There was very little application of some of the latest science. Um, and the staff showed very little initiative. Now this surprised me given the nature of the job they were doing. But it was clear to me that they had never been asked to show any initiative and therefore didn't offer any and it was a challenge to get them to understand it maybe took six months to a year I think they they, they, they they had been used to one regime that had not changed for years and here was this strange person from halfway around the world coming in and asking all these questions about how the gene bank was running and, and, and what one should do and I think they probably found it quite a threat but in, in exploring these issues with them and, and getting them to understand that there, you know, there are always two sides to a situation that you can, you can um, s ask questions about what they're doing and why they're doing it <clears throat> and then making suggestions as to perhaps it might be worthwhile looking at some different options. Over time, they realized that I wasn't there to, to, to really well, as I think they thought I was going to destroy things, but to actually make opportunities for them to get more involved, to free up time to give them more exciting things to do. Um, and so we made major changes in our data management, the management of the seeds. We, we were given the opportunity, very excitingly, to, to um, renovate our facilities. And there was a big renovation of facilities in the Institute in the early 90s anyway. <clears throat> and I was able to persuade Erie management to include the gene bank and we were good beneficiaries of that but almost everything that the gene bank did um, we had a, a, a you know a, a serious look at and and the staff responded uh, and in responding and participating and and taking ownership of what they did and and at the same time we were able to get the majority of the staff positions upgraded so that people took responsibility and accepted accountability. Within about four years we had what was clearly a top class genetic resources program that was built on the very solid foundations of my predecessor. But we had, we had brought it up to the end of the, the 20th century as it were. So when we had a um, uh, a gene bank review, I think it was in 1996, uh, it was clear that the Erie gene bank came out way ahead of, of the other gene banks in the CG system. And, and that review, that good positive review, is in due in no small part to the excellent staff 
that the Genetic Resources Centre on the gene bank side has. So what was my other challenge? Well, frankly, it was a, an injure group that didn't see that they needed to be included uh, in, a, in a new organisational structure and were really quite obstructive in trying to bring about changes that would have led to greater efficiencies. They just did not want to be part of the Genetic Resources Centre. And that really was quite a battle over the years. Now, as we know, India has now moved out of GRC and is now in plant breeding. Um, I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. And then, you know, um, India has to decide what it has to do. Um, but I had been given a mandate to try and bring about some, some efficiencies there. I mean, I wasn't head of India. I wasn't running it on a day-to-day -day basis, but I did have to try and provide the, the resources uh, under the umbrella of the Genetic Resources Center for India to, to, to operate. And I wanted to bring about changes, particularly in the field, so that we could, you know, use the staff resources in a much more flexible and beneficial way to all the operations in the gene bank. As I say, um, it was not a particularly comfortable um, number of years. Uh, we did get there in the end and by the time I left the gene bank there were various parts of the operations of both India and uh, the gene bank which uh, were working much more closely with each other and a single set of administrative procedures which in the end I think brought about efficiencies. Well it, I'm, I've actually been fortunate that I've actually had five careers but I've only worked in three places because I had two careers in, in SIP in Lima and then when I moved into the regional program my career in Birmingham and as you say two careers at, at Erie and when I joined Erie I more or less said to myself you know ten years that'll be about the right sort of time and here we are almost 19 years later and I'm still here but I, I said to myself 10 years would be the, the appropriate time to, to, to be at the Institute and towards the end of the the, the 90s um, a number of opportunities outside Erie did occur which I, I did look at and in one or two cases was interviewed uh, but it was clear in my field that um, Carrying a British passport was, was not necessarily the, uh, the best thing, given the, the circumstances. But anyway, um, we'd had a, um, a group, uh, I can't remember who they were, I think it was associated with Future Harvest in some way, that came to look at in what they were considering as philanthropic fundraising. And somehow or other I'd got involved in these workshops. And I believe that one of the people involved in organizing the workshop had, had a word in uh, Ron Cantrell's ear and my name came up. That's what I'm, I'm led to believe. Anyway, the outcome was that I received a, a phone call from the DG's office one day saying, would I come over and, for a discussion? Well, I had at that time thought it might be something to do with the Emerging Global Crop Diversity Trust and had got at the back in my mind that perhaps somebody had asked for me to be seconded. That's what I, you know, the, the, the only scenario that I could possibly think of. So it was a bit of a shock when I walked into the DG's office and he was sitting there and there was Ren Wang, the DDG Research, and Willie Padolina, the DDG Operations and Support Services, sitting around the table and Mike, sit down. I'm going, <laughs> What's all this about? Anyway, um, the way Ron, Ron Cantrell put it, he said, you know, if a donor was to come to Erie tomorrow and offer $5 million, he said, I couldn't refuse it. He said, but I have no idea how it would fit in with the scheme of things. We really do not have much idea of what money we're raising, where, how it's being spent, etc. And we really do need to bring some order to this whole process and we'd like you to set up a, a new um, unit uh, it'll be at a director level 
Um, there had been a liaison coordination planning unit before, but for, for whatever reasons, it appears that that had not been as successful as it might have been. And he said, we want you to, to, to you know, clean, sleep, to clean slate, um, set something up. So we had a, 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 you know, a bit of a question and a discussion on it. And I do remember saying something else. I said, well, okay, I've got to think about this, but I think I can make it work if I can get somebody like Corinta Guerta to come and work with me. Well, I'd never worked with Corinta. Um, she, is, she was a soil chemist in uh, another division. But I'd been aware of some of the things she'd been involved in, and I'd been on an interview panel, a uh, promotion panel, a couple of years before and was very impressed with what, with what I'd seen. Anyway, um, to cut a long story short, uh, Ron Cantrell asked me to consider moving from a re essentially a research division into the senior management team and for a number of reasons I actually turned him down and said no. And we left it at that. Um, there were certain aspects of the TOR, terms of reference, that I wasn't particularly happy with, and he wouldn't budge on. And about six weeks later, through a roundabout way, I got a message that they were still looking to fill the position, and if I was interested, um, he'd like to have a, another chat with me about it. So. We, 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 we had another chat and there were certain aspects of the TOR that he wouldn't budge on but there were others that he would and um, so we came to an agreement and on the 1st of May um, 2001 I started as Director for Programme Planning and Coordination and that's what I've been doing for the last nine years essentially. Yes it's very different from running a gene bank but in some ways it's not. Um, a gene bank, in order for a gene bank to operate, you have to make sure that all the different elements, all the different processes, the flows of information are integrated and work together. And in the gene bank, you manage samples of seeds, which we call accessions. Well, managing donor relations, managing projects, managing contracts, etc., is a little bit like running a gene bank. Instead of packets of seeds, we have grants, we have projects, we have contracts, and all the information that flows between them. And one of the important things that I, I think I've, I brought to the gene bank and to this particular office is some systematic way of doing business. Uh, it, one of my biggest frustrations at Erie is the fact that in the past we have ended up, when you're asked to do something, doing it multiple times. Because the instructions for doing something have never been clearly spelt out. And so you waste an awful amount of time with people interpreting what they have to do. Well, I like to try and do something once and do it right. And I was able to build a team here in what we call DPPC who understood what I was trying to achieve and I think we achieved it. We've set up systems uh, of interaction with the donors, we've certainly raised the profile and the reputation of the Institute uh, with the donors. I think we've contributed significantly to increasing the budget of the Institute uh, by ensuring that our, the Institute's response is coordinated in such a way that the identity of the Institute is clearly there in any communication, branding, that the quality of the communications is as high as we can achieve it and I, for that I have to thank the support that we have received over the years from the communications and publication services staff who've helped us and uh, I think have clearly understood what we were out to achieve both in the presentation of materials and the editing and the quality of writing and to be able to deliver not next week 
or the week after or the week after that but when there's something to be done it gets done and delivered and I think that is very important I mean one of the one of the um, significant issues when I when I did move was that um, a the Institute didn't really know how many grants it had it more or less on the back of an envelope type operation so within the first week we actually made a, a, an inventory of all the grants we thought the Institute had and then we then we applied a really high-powered piece of rocket science we gave everything a unique ID just like we would an accession in a gene bank and in that way through all our database work the database uh, development all our communications with donors it was then able we were then able to track information between these offices between the finance office HR wherever uh, and, and and to provide you know a backbone on which you can then start to assemble all the other pieces of, of, of information and the other thing we discovered is that the Institute was about 90 percent deficient shall we say in reporting its grants back to donors and the Institute was getting hurt we were getting a bad reputation as the bad boy of the system you know Erie does not deliver now you can argue I, I suppose the value of reporting and I know our scientists uh, get quite frustrated at times that they are required to take time out from what they see as more important things to sit down and write reports but that's part of the contract part of the deal of receiving research funding that you you report back to somebody how you actually spent the money did you achieve what you say you were going to do and this is this is important for accountability because I think we have to accept that the the funding we get is somebody else's tax dollars or tax pounds or euros um, and the agencies that give us the funding have a constituency to report back to so they have to be able to say whether the funding was applied appropriately but ERI wasn't reporting well we got that down to about 10 percent within six months just by making the whole reporting process part of doing research you write a concept note a proposal it's submitted you implement your 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 research you report back periodically and at the end of the, the project you bring it all together and hopefully it leads to out, out those outputs lead to outcomes and an impact but you have a way of monitoring that all the way through now those weren't in place before it's absolutely standard operating procedure now at Erie and I think it's one of the strengths that the 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 office brought to the whole research management uh, at the Institute I was joking with somebody a few weeks ago about when it's my time at the at the guest house for the hail and farewell and they said what do you want on your plaque and I said about well, I don't particularly appreciate you know these 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 long statements that that go on forever about everything you ever did uh, 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 and I would like if it were possible for for people to remember my contributions at Erie in the following way he left things better than he found them and I think in terms of the gene bank we we made significant changes in the way that we manage rice germplasm in the field in the greenhouse in the, uh, the, the 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 whole processing that prior to the material going into the gene bank in our data management systems etc we we built um, a series of operations that I think are world-class and that the Institute should be proud of and I'm certainly proud of that uh, and, 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 and I think it was a, um, a good basis for my successor Rory Sattleville Hamilton to come in and he's been able to build on those as I had built on the on the the, the, the foundation that T.T. Chang um, established and much of what we we, we built 
um, in the 1990s is in place. Um, I'm pleased about the contributions we made to the debate discussions about on-farm conservation. Uh, we were successful in the mid-90s to to receive over three million dollars from the Swiss Development Corporation for a project to collect germplasm around the world and we increased the size of the collection by um, 25 percent. We also trained a lot of people in germplasm but I was able to recruit a population geneticist and a social anthropologist to work side by side on a project um, on on-farm conservation. There was a lot of propaganda, shall we say, that this was the, you know, gene banks were, were what people were calling gene mortuaries. You know, don't put your seeds in a gene bank, it'll be forgotten, and material will die. <coughs> And need, needless to say, I do not believe that if the gene bank is, is, is properly managed. And everybody was, a lot of people were saying we, we, we need to um, increase our investment in on-farm conservation. My concern was, or on-farm in situ conservation, um, it was very, it was quite dangerous promoting an approach or a technology without really knowing what it meant, what the dynamics of such a, a situation system were. So it was good that we were able to get a population geneticist who could actually look at uh, how farmer varieties were changing genetically, if indeed they were changing, and to have a social anthropologist trying to put that into some sort of social context. So I was very pleased about that and we got a number of quite uh, important publications out there and made a contribution to that overall debate. I would say in general the clamour for on-farm conservation has in fact declined over the last decade since we finished that work. Um, in terms of uh, an, another area, I, I, I was able <clears throat> towards the end of the 90s to persuade the system-wide genetic resources program to uh, provide funding for a workshop that I conceptualized and in fact we ran in the Netherlands at what was then is now over a three or four day period in September 1999. I'd heard a, a paper at a, one of the rice genetics congresses here in Manila given by the late Dr. Mike Gale who had uh, done a significant amount of work on the genetic similarities between wheat and maize and rice, etc. And it got me thinking that, you know, if it were possible to find a gene <coughs> in wheat, say for drought resistance, or let's take a better example, in sorghum, that you could find the genetic basis for drought in sorghum, could you use that information, I was thinking from a molecular point of view, uh, could you use that to go and probe a germplasm collection of rice to find drought genes? Well, we organized this workshop in, in, in the Netherlands. We got some of the best people from around the world in comparative genetics and genomics. I think we were four or five years too soon because some of the technologies that we now take for absolutely for granted were only beginning to emerge but there was you know that sort of glimmer on the horizon that we weren't being too fanciful I wasn't able to take it forward uh, for a number of reasons it it didn't find a lot of favor here at Erie but within 18 months they'd formed the generation challenge program as you know Bob Ziegler was the first director of that challenge program and he had attended my workshop. Uh, and so I think some of the thinking that we put into comparative genetics from a germplasm collection management point of view uh, found its way into the thinking of the of the generation challenge program. And I think that was 
quite interesting that a group of genetic conservationists should have, as it were, been pushing the agenda in that area. Um, and it goes without saying that the, the, I think the, the stability that we have brought to uh, our donor relations and fundraising here at IRI um, has, has put us ahead of the game compared to many other institutions. And uh, yeah, and it's you know, uh, it, it will be with a, a a sense of satisfaction when I do finally come to leave the institute in a few weeks' time that we've we've put in place some solid foundations from which the institute can continue to grow. Erie is a very complex organisation. I mean, it, it, it's in in many ways, it's it's a Filipino organisation over which you have this sort of layer of international staff. Um, some of the ways that the Institute does business um, I still don't understand uh, because of the relationships at, at various levels. You have that added complexity of um, the international staff. I forget how many nationalities were, 30 nationalities. And we all look at the world in, 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 in different ways. What is of, um, of, what is a value to somebody, say, from France or from India, may be very different to what I perceive as a value as a British citizen. So we do look at the world in different ways. And that is, is both a fantastic opportunity when you're working in, in this sort of group. And of course, I had lived abroad before, worked in a CG center 10 years, more than 10 years before I joined here, so it wasn't new to me. Um, but it's both a, uh, an opportunity and a great challenge. And so I, w I would say there's never been huge frustrations. There's been lots of small battles uh, that one has had to, to, to wage. Um, Erie is, I know this because I've talked to people in other centres, um, Erie is, is regarded as being a, quite an arrogant centre. Um, and I think it has good reason in many ways for that. I mean, we do set ourselves some targets to reach. We do esteem good science. Do we always reach it? Well, that's for others to, to judge, our peers to judge. Um, the sometimes, I think, and it can be dangerous, um, a sense of self-satisfaction that leads people working at the Institute to accept the status quo and not want to push the boundaries. Not, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's very much, well, this is the way we've done it for the last 30 years, why change? Um, and so there are things that happen or don't happen that are based on that sort of attitude which I don't think are um, really acceptable in an international organization um, 50 years after its, uh, after its foundation. So that can be frustrating, getting people to, to, to accept that there's, you can always make change and things better. And to be thinking about those opportunities rather than sort of sitting back and, and being comfortable all the time. Um, I, I have to say I've been blessed. I have had two fantastic groups of staff who've come to understand the values that I have and the goals and objectives that I set for myself and I'll set for the, for the for in the first case, GRC and then the program planning and coordination. And they've gone along with me and understood why I've wanted to do things in a particular way uh, and, and it's not been a struggle working with them. They've been extremely supportive and, and that has been one of the joys of working at Erie. You say hindsight, hindsight is a wonderful thing. Some of the things I would have liked to have done were not possible because we didn't have the technology. There are things they're doing now that you know I had thought wouldn't it be nice to be able to do but we couldn't. We either couldn't afford it 
I mean, the, the, the fantastic opportunity we have now that the rice genome has been sequenced. Uh, we have a whole range of molecular technologies and approaches that just weren't available in the early 90s. Um, we take for granted that everybody has a computer on their desk. When I arrived, and Mark Vandenberg, who is head of IT now, was head of IT in 1991, uh, and I sort of had to almost get down on my knees and beg for a, for a PC on my desk. Uh, it just wasn't that routine. And now there are a number of things that we do and we really couldn't contemplate doing without access to some of these technologies. So I, I often think, boy, if I'd had that available when I was running the gene bank, what would we have done? So... The, but the opportunities presented themselves at a later date and other people have taken up the, up the, up the mantle, as it were. And so it's great to see some of those, those ideas being taken, taken forward. So I certainly, uh, you know, there's never been a time, I can't think, and I've thought about this quite long and hard, there's never really been a time during the, the 18 plus years that I've been here, nearly 19, where I felt, so frustrated I just wanted to get out of it. Um, lots of petty frustrations but we all find that in, 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 in working in an organization like this. I, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's not been plain sailing, far from it, but it hasn't been stormy weather either. I'm looking back on 40 years of, 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 of a career and okay 40 years actually takes me back to when I was a, 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 a um, a final year or, or, or senior year undergraduate. Because it was at that time that, you know, in a sense, my career was, was pushed in a, in a certain direction. But we are all um, the result of the ideas that we've picked up, the people that we, we have interacted with, um, and, and, and how they've influenced what we do. I mean, for, for example, you know, what made Melissa Fitzgerald become a soil chemist and Eugene became a, a writer editor in the communications business? Why did I become a botanist and then move into... It's all... It's environment in a sense. There must, there, there must be something genetic there, but it's a lot... It's a lot... It's environment. So the people... And looking over my career, it's the people that I've... I've interacted with. I have been very fortunate, I think, to have had a number of people who were fantastic mentors. And I've always made it a point, wherever I've been, um, is to sort of establish um, an interaction with one or two people with whom I could share, you know, aspects of, 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 of what I was doing. You know, there's, it's always good to have somebody who you can trust, who you can bounce ideas off uh, and get their reactions. You don't have to follow what they, they say, but it's great to have that. And, I, and, and everywhere I've been, I've had somebody that I could go to and say, well, look, this is a concern, or what do you think of the following, and, and got that sort of feedback. Um, that, I think, is very important in somebody's career. Um, but having spent most of my career working overseas, and I got in, the, as you can imagine, the CG uh, right at the ground floor. Uh, the CG had been formed, I think, in the back end of 70, uh, 71 or early 72, and I joined SIP in 1973, January. That's over 37 years ago. And in SIP, we were six members of staff no laboratories, virtually no offices, and um, it, that was quite an experience. I was, I was 24 years old and sort of thrown into this uh, the deep end. And I got to meet many of the people who helped form the CG. Uh, I wouldn't say people were evangelical about it, but uh, there did seem to be a sense of purpose as to why you were there working in a centre and what you could achieve and the donors certainly, I think, had a much better understanding then than they do today. Now, it's always dangerous saying all oh, things were better 
in the good old days. Um, but with this whole process that has gone on now for two or three years, the so-called change process, I really do think that there are quite a significant number of people outside the centres, but also within the centres, who have frankly lost the plot. I don't think there's a, a good understanding anymore of what the centres can or should deliver. There seems certainly amongst colleagues in other centres, a feeling that science is not, good science, is not a, uh, is something that we shouldn't necessarily strive for. Science doesn't seem to, you know, appear part of the equation. Process seems to be more important than output. Um, and I, I, you, you were talking, we were talking about frustration uh, a little while ago, and I suppose talking about this now maybe is my biggest frustration. Uh, and, 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 and a little sad at the end of my career, having come in at the ground floor and now leaving the CG or leaving an uh, Erie, as the CG is trying to, trying to change in a way that I, I don't think if things go the way they're they could go, is going to be particularly helpful for Erie, but more importantly for the for the people for whom Erie works, and, and that is that that has been over the last couple of years or so a, a serious frustration. Um, but that is not a frustration of me doing my particular job. It's a, a general frustration as to in, in the ways in which <coughs> international agricultural research seems to be going with research now with a lowercase r rather than uppercase. Um, yeah, I, 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 it, the, the things I really remember are the people who, who, who contributed to that whole development of international agricultural research. Um, people who were contemporaries of, of, of Borlaug and they were ex-Rockefeller people who'd been in Mexico. Those that had helped set up the centers uh, the donors in those days uh, were many of whom had also worked worked um, overseas, and so they understood better um, what the centres were trying to achieve, and that's all become rather blurred.